So we're here at the Nanotechnology uh, Gardener um, here in Thessaloniki. And hi, so who are you? I'm uh, Kyriakos Kumbopoulos. Yeah. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of California at Berkeley. Okay, let's just go over here, right here. Um, oui. So, um, maybe you can come a little bit closer. Yeah. Um, so, California Berkeley, and what do you do over there? Uh, I'm a professor of mechanical engineering, but uh, the focus of my work also is related to the theme of this conference, which is nanotechnology and nanosciences. Uh, that is the new technologies and the new fields of science that uh, are concerned with the behavior of uh, material and devices at the nanoscale, at very small dimensions. Uh, so this conference is, uh, now it's in uh, uh, 16th year, it started uh, uh, several years ago here in Greece as a one-day workshop and uh, started growing because also nanotechnology started growing at the same time and now has become a multi-faceted uh, uh, conference that attracts uh, more than 600 people from all over the world. So 16 years ago was just one day workshop? Yes. And how long time did it take before it became grow, grew like this? Uh, it started growing slowly, uh, probably it came to its current size uh, maybe uh, five years after it started uh, converting to a conference and being publicized uh, internationally as such. Uh, and, and currently, as I said, is in its uh, peak. Uh, we, we have uh, added also a couple of other conferences that are uh, taking place at the same time, such as a conference on organic materials, on solar panels, on photonics. Uh, that was emerged and uh, is offered uh, in parallel with this uh, conference. Uh, a school, summer school started also and it's taking place simultaneously. Uh, where students, usually graduate students of the university, are uh, uh, attending lectures that some of the participants at the conference uh, provide. And most of them, again, are related to nanotechnology uh, and nanosciences. And um, all those 16 years you were in Berkeley or...? Yes, all the 16 years I was in Berkeley. But you often come to Greece? or I come every summer almost in Greece because my relatives are back here. And uh, I always come to this city, Thessaloniki, uh, because we were spending our vacation in Chalkidiki. And also because uh, in 94, 1994, I uh, met the Professor Logothetidis, who is the uh, spearheader of this conference uh, completely by accident and because we happen to have uh, the same instrument and a company that uh, wanted to uh, provide some services to his instrument asked me if uh, I could talk with him and explain to him the, the difference between my instrument and his instrument and so that's how I became acquainted with him. And after discussing our interests, we found a lot of common interest in the nanoscale, where at that time we didn't have even the term nanotechnology established. Uh, and that's why it became more of a workshop where a couple of people like me arriving in the same almost time frame uh, here uh, will give some lectures and some of the local people will join in and and make that a one-day workshop. Uh, but as the time went by and the uh, focus of internationally and the term of nanotechnology uh, since uh, the early of 2000 became more of an established uh, name and a new field, uh, the workshop grew and became uh, today what is known as international conference. In my view, one of the top five uh, uh, conferences in nanotechnology. So what's the other four? 
Uh, there, are other, there are other nanotechnologies in the world that are offered in various places or related. In the USA? To, uh, USA and uh, mostly in the USA and uh, maybe in Japan and China, one or two more also. Uh, but none of this uh, kind of breadth that we see here, uh, because like I said, this uh, two or three conferences merged together under the auspices of nanotechnology, nano, nanosciences, and a summer school, uh, and that obviously makes it a very, very big event. Plus the exposition that uh, also adds about 30 to 40 uh, booths, uh, various expositions that you can see on nanotechnology-related uh, topics. So are you co-founder of the conference, or you came in after there it was no already There is no co-founder. I mean, I, I was one of the first to uh, sort of... Uh, the first one? Of the, of the, uh, since the first one, I have, uh, I have not missed one. Uh, I had, uh, among others, suggested that we should uh, uh, publicize this more and make it more of an international conference, and I'm very happy to see that uh, this is happening. But, the main person that is running the show is Professor Lokothetidis, who has made a tremendous job in, in really making that, uh, uh, bringing that to the statue that is today. So it's one of the leading ones in Europe? It definitely is the, probably the number one in Europe and, like I said, the one of the top four or five in the world. And so uh, what do you do over there in Berkeley? So I work in... Uh, 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 mechanical, electrical, chemical, and biochemical uh, properties of surfaces. I'm in the surface science group, thin films. Uh, and so I'm concerned about uh, all of these uh, materials, especially at the nanoscale, what kind of mechanical, electrical, optical, chemical, and biophysical characteristics uh, they have. Specifically, we're looking at very thin films, diamond-like films, as protective overcoats for next generation hard disk drives. Uh, we're looking into uh, tissue uh, formation uh, from uh, scaffolds, electro spinning of uh, polymeric scaffolds, and then impregnation with uh, stem cells that we can trigger them to differentiate to various types of cells to create different types of tissues. We work in uh, problems that related to uh, uh, manufacturing uh, of uh, wearable devices. Uh, these are devices that uh, contain electronics, but they have to be able to sustain large deformations as they are applied to our body, like a, 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 a forehead band or a wristband that can uh, monitor your temperature and your heartbeat. Uh, so we're working on making these materials to be able to sustain these repetitive uh, loadings uh, and also the electronics where they have to be strategically placed in locations where we can control and minimize deformation so that their electronic behavior is not jeopardized. Uh, we are also working in a, a new field of bonding of uh, semiconductor materials by a purely mechanical process known as ultrasonic bonding. Uh, and uh, a lot of work also goes into modeling of various uh, contact problems. Uh, for example, imparting in uh, simulation codes the properties and the morphology of uh, surfaces. This can be the interface of a human artificial joint that we want to model and determine the stress and strains uh, into this uh, uh, artificial implant which will then enable us to return and optimize uh, the design and the properties of this implant. So we do a lot of uh, computation analysis that uh, yeah, goes along with the, with the experiments. So uh, this bonding with the semiconductors, how does that work? What does so it, it do compared the, to what's there now? Yeah, so the ultrasonic wire bonding is uh, a, a process where we can uh, connect with the conductive wire to uh, boards, to electronic boards. Uh, the traditional way has been to do soldering. In this case, you have to melt the uh, wire 
and part of the substrate and introduce a soldering material. Uh, so you have a, three different materials that they have to weld together uh, and also heat. And all of these are pro uh, creating problems to the circuitry and the uh, cost of the bonding process. The ultrasonic wire bonding process essentially uses a tool that is vibrating to press against the wire and basically smear it over the uh, board substrate and create therefore a mechanical bond by causing this uh, wire to plastically deform and flow on the board surface. So it's completely solderless and uh, temperature free. Uh, process. Is it easy to do or is it very difficult to uh, do? There are, oh, every process has its own problems, so uh, we need, we're working to understand better how the bonding forms and how the wire, uh, as it is uh, compressed and uh, forced to flow on the substrate, deforms plastically. So, yeah, the, there are problems related with uh, wire transfer material from the wire transferring of the bonding tool or wear of the bonding tool. So uh, we're trying to solve these problems uh, both from experiments and simulations. So if this works, the PCB and the CPUs on the PCB and all that, uh, all the electronics will change appearance? Well, the, the bonding process will change, uh, definitely. Uh, uh, the process is already in the market, so we are funded by uh, one of the companies that is pioneering this work. Uh, it has been around for 10 years and uh, trying to become more competitive by uh, solving the problems that come with that. For example, extending the number of bonds that the tool can perform before it has to be cleaned or before it has to be replaced because of wear problems. And what about those hard drives? Uh, I'm always amazed by the amount of data I can put on them. So are you working on the next cutting edge, next things that are, are happening, like the 3D layers and all this stuff, and what they yes. call the hammer, or what they call it? Yes, so we're working on the hammer technology, which stands for heat-assisted magnetic recording. So the new generation of uh, hard disk drives, uh, in order to be able to store more information and therefore have a higher uh, storage capacity, we are aiming to 10 terabits per square inch of area. Uh, requires that uh, we have uh, very small magnetic domains in the magnetic medium that uh, is deposited on the hard disk and on top of that a protective carbon overcoat to protect it from corrosion or wear if the head touches to that. Uh, as the uh, science has advanced to the point that we can make these uh, magnetic domains, uh, the so-called bits, into the magnetic layer of this hard disk smaller and smaller, uh, we have uh, come across uh, to a physical limit known as the super paramagnetic limit. These uh, tiny magnetic domains can no longer remain stable as they're magnetized with their north or south poles upwards, uh, representing zeros and ones because the information is stored in the binary form with zeros and ones. So these small magnetic domains tend to flip and that has necessitated to be to the technology to change them from a soft magnet which was easy for the magnetic head to flip and uh, therefore polarize it differently every time that information needed to be written or erased to be made out of the so-called hard magnet. A hard magnet is a material that uh, is stable because it requires a high uh, intensity magnetic field in order to be changed. And that magnetic field is not available by its neighboring small magnetic domains. It's not also available by the magnetic head that now cannot erase information and polarize again those magnetic bits. So here is where the term heat comes in and is related to the fact that a laser beam now is integrated with the magnetic head and its purpose is to locally and instantaneously hit uh, the magnetic domain, the bit, uh, lowering its coercivity, that is its magnetic strength, so that the magnetic head with its magnetic field can at the same time polarize it. 
and as the laser moves over, the uh, bit immediately uh, cools down to room temperature and locks the new polarization and returns to its high coercivity, strong, strong magnetic. So that obviously poses a lot of uh, more stringent requirements to the protective overcoat that now has to sustain these heat pulses uh, that is uh, receiving from the head whenever information is needed to be uh, locally retrieved, or recorded or uh, rewritten. So our work is to make these films not only thin and hard and smooth but also thermally stable. So we're studying uh, with some advanced microscopy, cross-section microscopy methods, uh, how this uh, structure of these films retains its diamond-like uh, character uh, when it's heated and it's not becoming graphitic because that would uh, be uh, catastrophic for the protection of the head and also the disc where they're both coated with this thin diamond-like carbon overcoat. So when you have these things work, uh, then companies like Seagate might uh, buy it from you, or they sponsor it, or something like that? Uh, we are currently funded heavily by Western Digital, uh, which is one of the pioneers, and Seagate is, of course, one other bigger, uh, big competitor. Uh, we are working together with their team, and we're providing the fundamental knowledge that uh, will enable them to move faster to the next production and the next uh, device that will have the Hammer technology. And Hammer is happening, it's already kind of shipping, yeah, right? it's already happening, it's already shipping, but uh, there are always uh, challenges that uh, would like to make this even more robust. And uh, universities uh, in the U.S. are usually tar uh, targeted by these big industries uh, in anticipation of the forthcoming challenges as they're going to be uh, trying to boost their products to the next generation, they need to acquire this basic knowledge ahead of time before this can happen. Is this nanotechnology? It is nanotechnology because the uh, protective overcoat, the diamond-like film that we're talking about, that we are synthesizing in my lab and then we characterize it, is about one or two nanometers. Uh, so that's about one millionth of the diameter of, a, of the human hair. So you can understand the big challenges that uh, are behind it, uh, making those to be continuum, so they're no, uh, n they're, they don't form like islands that they then tend to merge as you get them, as you get this thing, uh, this coating thicker. Uh, but also they retain also their diamond-like characteristics uh, as they're heated. So the characterization is very challenging for very thin films and because of the uh, nanometer size that uh, they have, we have to use nanotechnology derived uh, instruments like nanoprobes that we can poke these films and, and try to understand their mechanical properties without uh, getting the uh, effect of the substrate. Because you want the data to, to remain there and I find that totally amazing. You're talking about the, the space of two two nanometers yes. and that uh, it just reliably stays there. I guess there's a lot of statistical kind of mathematics in there, so there's a uh, redundancy and stuff in the way Certainly. that hard drives are made. Yes. But uh, is it completely different to how hard drives were made before? Uh, some of the basic principles are the same, but when I started working in this field, the protective overcoat was half a micro, that is 500 nanometers. And now we're talking about one or two nanometers. So you can understand that we have two orders of magnitude decrease in the size of this overcoat. How long oh, time to do to do this two orders well, the, of magnitude decrease? The, that happened over two decades, two and a half decades. Uh, it, it didn't happen uh, immediately from 500 nanometers to two. It gradually came down. And the motivation behind was uh, to bring the magnetic uh, transducer on the head as close as possible to the magnetic layer on the hard disk. Obviously because the magnetic domains were getting smaller uh, since the densities that we were aiming for were increasing and having this uh, magnetic domain smaller required a more focused magnetic field. So you need to have the transducer on the magnetic head as close as possible 
if ideally, uh, theoretically, I would say, in contact with the magnetic layer in order to uh, uh, individually polarize those uh, magnetic domains. So this resulted into reducing both the flying height of the head and also the thickness of the overcoat as they're both contributing to that distance that is an obstacle to focus and enhance the magnetic field because it changes exponentially with the distance. Uh, uh, so the intensity of this field we want to be as high as possible so that we can magnetize hard magnetic domains in the magnetic layer and also as close as possible to the magnetic head so that we can focus on a single bit. We don't want to polarize several bits at the same time. All this just sounds so awesome. Uh, I don't know how many 8 terabyte hard drives I have, but if this all works out in the next couple of years, we might have 100 terabyte hard drives, right? It's gonna, it's, it must be really fascinating field to work in, right? Uh, absolutely, yeah. So uh, like I said, the, the immediate goal is 10 terabits per square inch. Okay. That's a lot of, a big hard drive, no? How big uh, does it, ooh, so, how big does it get? So currently, so currently you can get uh, a drive, the whole drive to be about one terabit. But I'm talking about 10 terabits per square inch. So uh, you can get a drive today that is one and a quarter of an inch or two inches in diameter. And that whole uh, disc can be about uh, one terabyte. Uh, now we're talking about the square inch of that, not the whole disc. The whole uh, disc has a bunch of square inches. Yes, yes. So you can make the math and see how many square inches is depending on the diameter. Uh, but uh, usually in that field we go by the square inch and the cost is determined also by the square inch. So uh, 20 years ago we had a few hundreds of megabytes per square inch. Okay, and now we went to Terra, which is a hundred times more. We're talking about now, we have demonstrated one or two terabytes per square inch. Uh, that's already uh, in the market. And we are aiming now one order higher, 10 terabits per square inch. It has been always said that, uh, that uh, the magnetic recording probably has reached saturation because uh, you wouldn't be able to make uh, such small domains or, or being able to individually uh, polarize those domains if you were to make them. And that's where the nanotechnology comes because it provides the materials, nanomaterials, nanodomains we're talking about here, and also the instrumentation to test those materials, the fabrication now of uh, smaller heads we have the so-called pico heads, pico sliders, pico heads. So not nano heads yet. And not nano. Yeah, well, pico is smaller than nano. Oh, it is. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so the technology, the nanotechnology, provides really uh, the tools that enable us to to reach this kind of uh, materials uh, to. Uh, uh, accuracy in terms of their microstructure and thickness uh, but also the ability to uh, maintain in such a close proximity a head that is flying at 10 meters per second over the disc. Uh, someone uh, made the following analogy which is easier to for uh, the people that are not familiar to understand is like uh, an um, F-16 flying at two max over a jungle and touching the higher tips of the higher trees, the tips of the higher trees. Without damaging the tree. Without damaging the trees and without being damaged itself, uh, if that can happen. Uh, so the shear rates are very high of the head that is flying over the disc and that's why, uh, and flying so close, uh, it may cause uh, instantaneously some contact to take place between the head and the disc. That's why both the head and the disc are coated with this ultra-thin diamond-like carbon overcoat that I mentioned earlier, which serves that purpose, that is protecting both media to be damaged in case of an um, intimate contact that takes place. And of course, the other protection that provides is corrosion.
resistance. Uh, how does it? How is it possible to that it can read and write at two nanometers and so fast and all that stuff? Well, now you are asking a question about the controls, which is another area that has really uh, uh, improved uh, dramatically, and uh, uh, and that requires that uh, you can control the position with a very fast feedback control that uh, requires a suspension to first micro position uh, the head over a given track and then nano position the head over a given bit. So we have two stages of micro and nano positioning uh, and control of the flying height that are based on feedback control. Uh, so all the control uh, systems that are uh, on the suspension of the head have also gone along the same uh, journey with the materials and the mechanics uh, in response to the requirements. It's a multi-engineering uh, problem uh, that requires uh, all ma many disciplines to uh, be involved in that. That's so awesome. And we just covered a two of those you mentioned. You also mentioned stuff about um, uh, nanomedicine, right? Yes. So. Uh, we are uh, interested in developing tissue, so we are creating this spongy type of polymeric biodegradable materials that we then impregnate them uh, with stem cells, epithelial cells, smooth muscle cells, uh, understand, trying to understand how these cells can migrate into the porosity of this uh, biodegradable material and begin to develop tissue. Uh, this scale is probably not as small as the previous ones, but uh, it still requires some understanding about cellular behavior. So we have developed uh, a microfabrication process where we can isolate individual cells on a platform and then use nanotechnology-based uh, force microscopy, like the atomic force microscope, that enables us to poke press against these individual cells and determine their mechanical characteristics. Um, for example, we can also determine and how they are different between a cancerous cell or a healthy cell. So the, the probe that we're using is an FM probe. We're applying pico-newton forces. So here is even one, uh, two orders of magnitude smaller than nano. Uh, and we are using confocal microscopy to observe in real time how the uh, cell is uh, deforming and establish um, relationship between force and deformation of these cells and how this can be different between T cells and stem cells or cancerous cells. Uh, that begins to also provide some insight into biologists that relates to migration of, uh, of uh, cancerous cells. We have found, for example, that cancerous cells are softer than healthy cells. So that may be an, a reason, one of the reasons, that they can mo more easily can uh, uh, diffuse through the pores of the tissue and therefore migrate at different places. And are you doing this kind of analysis inside real people or just a bunch of tissue in a lab on the side? Uh, we are uh, doing that at the lab scale. We have gone uh, also to uh, animal models where we have implanted uh, these uh, uh, scaffolds uh, percutaneously into rats uh, and retrieve them after a week or two weeks and then do the immunohistochemistry analysis to see what kind of reactions they have uh, induced and whether uh, they have enticed the cells of the uh, animal to uh, uh, migrate into that or, or not. All of these are uh, also done at the animal uh, uh, stage. We have uh, not gone to the clinical stage yet. Uh, that requires uh, collaborations with the medical school. Uh, we have uh, uh, some ideas about that and perhaps collaborating with the uh, uh, University of California at San Francisco across the bay uh, with the medical school they have if we reach that stage.
And is it possible that things in that uh, in that uh, field could develop very quickly? Because people would like to see some results. Uh, that will depend on the outcome of the animal and clinical studies that are currently ongoing. Uh, and of course FDA then approvals and all of this that takes quite of some time. The, the fortunate uh, or the good thing or the positive thing on that is that we are using FDA approved materials and that's a big plus because that usually takes a long time if you're introducing a new material. Um, so it remains to be seen but uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can make better and faster strides in the future. I wish I could ask you a bunch more but uh, how about, can I ask you, uh, I, I, I guess you really enjoy your, your, your job, right? Uh, this is my hobby and I feel fortunate that I get paid to do my hobby. It's the best job for me in the planet and I enjoy it very much. And all the stuff you're talking about is a lot of collaborators, a lot of students, is a lot of what? Absolutely, yes. Uh, as you can understand, this uh, multidisciplinarity is here. And that's why perhaps uh, if uh, one a person in, is to be judged based on the department or the school that he or she are, that's probably misleading if this person is in a leading school. Uh, top schools usually work at the frontiers of technologies. Today's technologies are multidisciplinary and therefore not only the individual has to have knowledge beyond the classical areas of his or her discipline, but also collaborations and being able to collaborate with uh, people completely from completely different fields. And uh, Berkeley is one of the, I guess, one of the top in the world, I guess, right? Uh, uh, I mean, it sounds like it, it could be. Well, I, but, think, uh, I think people say it. Berkeley is very good school, so I'm not the one who yeah. will make that, but I think we are... But uh, is, could you in any way think or say how things could go faster? Uh, I say the, the biggest element here is funding. Just funding? Funding. If you have the funding, then things can happen very fast. Not far from Berkeley, there's a lot of big funds. There's a lot of 100 billionaire companies, right? And they, they, maybe they don't know where to spend their money sometimes. That's true, and that may be requiring a, a, a different uh, outreach approach from both sides. Uh, it took for quite some time for this multidisciplinarity to happen and even now you can see many institutions having barriers because people from one discipline they don't want to make the extra effort to educate themselves and connect with their uh, next building neighbors. So you can imagine how bigger the problem is with uh, uh, going outside the academia if you consider also proprietary issues uh, that uh, companies are very cautious about. Yeah, in the U.S. there's a lot of lawsuits, I heard. Yes. And so there's the lawsuits, there's uh, uh, IP, there's uh, corporate, uh, what do you call it, uh, patents and all that stuff. Yes, yes. But um, uh, if, let's say, there was a few billion dollars to something, you sure that things could go much faster? Absolutely. And that's why we see some of the foundations like Zuckerman's and Chan uh, the founder of uh, Facebook has now made several donations in institutions including uh, Berkeley, Stanford and uh, 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 where they created an uh, incubator uh, by putting 600 million dollars for uh, this kind of uh, uh, future research to be accelerated. And to accelerate is just put more students onto it or how does it work? Uh, it's one brings the other of course it uh, requires the infrastructure the, the, the instrumentation but then the the people that do all the work of course are students and uh, guided by faculty and so you cannot separate one of the other good students uh, and good faculty and well equipped uh, uh, laboratories are needed plus good interaction uh, with other laboratories, industry or uh, hospitals. Uh, an integration of that level is required when we're talking about this type of research.